to this uh, lecture that will be given by M Mariam Muradjan. I hope I say that correctly. Please correct me after. Uh, a special welcome to uh, members of the Armenian community, which I, who I understand are here tonight. It's very nice to have you here at Maastricht University. Very warm welcome. And to everyone else, thank you for joining us on this very cold evening for getting here through the cold and uh, getting to Maastricht University even late in the evening. Uh, my name is Marie Goldman. I am a children's rights researcher here at uh, Maastricht University Law Faculty. And it's my honor to be able to introduce Mariam to you. Uh, Mariam is a children's rights expert from Armenia. She works for the Global Campus for Human Rights, the Children's Rights Division in the Caucasus. Um, and she's here to speak to us about the participation of child advocates in armed conflict. And then Mariam and I, we know each other because uh, I'm working on a project on the rights of children in de facto states, and we were organizing a conference. And Mariam heard about this. We were already in touch with the Global Campus for Human Rights because they have this amazing format for uh, child participation in conferences. And uh, as it turns out, uh, Mariam was like, hey, what about Nagorno-Karabakh? Why is that not a case study in your, in your project? Uh, and we were actually very excited to include it. So thanks to Mariam, we have included that in the conference. I've been able to work with her, which has been a really great experience. And we're super happy that today she's here to talk to us more. And uh, one of the many things that I think is very interesting about Mariam is that she both combines um, research and education on children's rights at the academic level, but at the same time, and as part of that, I guess, she also works with children a lot and has extensive experience working with children, among other things, as a child protection officer. I have to say that, you know, having met her now for the first time in person and having met her before online, uh, when you hear her speak to me, it always sounds like it's like it must be at least five people in that one person, in that one soul. Like she has like five careers behind her already and, and she's so young. I don't know how she has managed to do so much and accumulate so much knowledge and experience uh, at such a young age. So I hope you enjoy listening to her as much as I have today and before. And I welcome you to the stage. Thank you very much for being here, Maria. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marike, for a nice introduction. Um, it's my biggest privilege to be here at the Masters University, which is one of the most privileged universities in the European Union. And um, I'm also privileged to present um, not only uh, child-related aspects, but also armed conflicts. I'm fully aware that in the auditorium we have specialists coming from the low background, but also students and professionals coming from diverse backgrounds, such as political science, social sciences. And I, tried, I will try to um, concentrate on different aspects of child participation and armed conflict from multidisciplinary approaches. Um, it's going to be much more interactive, although I'll be speaking for the first, uh, I hope that no more than hour, but um, then afterwards we'll have a chance to have a Q&A session. And um, although I'm coming from Armenia, but I've been a researcher at the Eastern Partnership in Central Asia, and I belong to a family of Global Campus, which has an extensive uh, research career throughout the world. So you are more than welcome to portray conflicts and situations in different other regions, and I'll try to comment within my capacities. Um, to start with, I would say that uh, what we won't be talking about um, is uh, armed conflict and child rights and child participation in armed conflict in terms of child soldiers. When we talk about armed conflicts and we talk about child participation, the immediate dimension that goes is child soldiers. We won't be talking about this. And child participation here is considered about political participation, departing their views and also holding their views. And how do we make children uh, listen to? How do we make children agents of change? So to start with, and of course we'll concentrate on Nagorno-Karabakh case too, uh, but it will be very much um, about, is it shifting? Yep. But it will be very much about um, other uh, conflicting areas too. So 
We'll be talking about Article 12, which is about child participation. But first of all, we have to understand how is it manifested in the society in general. So we understand that child particip participation is a process of sharing decision-making processes with children. So um, it's not only about acting for them, but it's also about acting with them. And um, it's not only about participation, but it's also about meaningful participation. This is what convention says. And we say that an involvement that can differ in form and style with children are different at ages and capacities. So the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 12, says that we have to consider children's views in their evolving capacities. But this term, evolving capacities, has been used as an excuse for very many adults to limit children's views, participation, and engagement, rather than how was considered as a treat. Because we know that children are progressing with their age, with, with every month even, especially at the first uh, years of their lives, with every day, every month, every year, they are progressing in a very, very rapid way. So the evolving capacities should be considered more as a privilege rather than limitation. And this has been an excuse for very many adults to limit them and to take the child participation in a very tokenistic way rather than in a privileged way. A skill that must be learned and practiced, we say. Uh, it's, a, it's a right of the child, but we consider it as a skill because we provide them with the capacity and we, we, we give children, we, I'm referring to adults, we give them a space to exercise it, an opportunity to exercise these skills, to see whether or not they want to do this or not. This is about advocating, this is about talking about their right to education, their, their right to leisure, to whatever right they want, but this is about exercising and this is about skills. We say that it's not an option and it cannot be withheld it's an opportunity and it's a voluntary engagement. So it's very important for the children to know that they can also not participate into whatever processes they want. It's a right to, to have participation and it's a right to excuse them for part not participating to this or that things. While talking about other aspects of um, child participation, as I said, it is voluntarily we as adults, we have to suggest, propose, rather than coerce or, or manipulate them for participation. For long years, especially in the political participation and in political settings, we could understand that children can be used as a matter of geopolitics, as a matter of working on the conscience of different organizations, different international agents, different decision makers, whereas they are not the ones who want, who, who's driving this force, who are the driving forces to share this or that thing. But they are being manipulated because of being a vulnerable group, because of being a different tool to um, work on the shame or work on the um, skills or capacities of different organizations. We have to differentiate these cases. If the country itself doesn't have a platform, a method, a model, to engage children in participation. And we, we analyze these countries. We can understand that uh, child participation would be no more than tokenistic way. Um, child adult relations is also very important. Um, child participation is only possible through the engagement of adults. This is upon adults to secure the environment. This is upon the adults to understand which form of participation is the best. And of course, it's upon the adults to safeguard the full engagement and full enjoyment of the other rights. So child participation is one of the rights of CRC, and participation should it prejudice the exercise of other rights too. We said that in most of the societies and in, in a post-Soviet society where I come from, we have to have a mind shift ourselves as adults. We have to realize that Indeed, it is very important. We have to realize that um, the processes, the feelings, the experience that the children are having are unique. And 
nothing in this world can replace that. No uh, academic knowledge, no experience of our own as adults will be the same. It's like in the cases of the uh, people with disabilities. I um, encountered the fact that UNICEF um, started promoting of uh, not uh, doing a simulation of disabilities. Uh, you know that there have been simulations such as a person which is fully able is sitting on a wheelchair and trying to get through an experience to prove that um, the environment is not physically supportive for the people with disabilities. But there have been a call for not doing so because your experience as a fully able P person wouldn't be the same with a disabled person. It's the same with the children. You never know what this person, what this child has gone through. And you also have to understand that the situations are different. Even though you come from the same society, same family structure, very similar things, very similar cultural things, but you will never have the understanding of the environment that the child has. Maybe he is a, a victim to a bullying, maybe he is um, subject to domestic violence, maybe he is a witness of this or that processes. And while talking about conflict in areas, you know that the situation is changing rapidly and through different negative dimensions. And as I said, mind shift of making child participation in an important thing within our heads is the most important principle among adults. So um, we talked about elements, but, oh yeah, it's going in a different direction, sorry. So what we say uh, as a prerequisites for participation, uh, there are many, but I would um, underline these three. It's about recognition and respect for children's agency and capacity. Agency in terms that they are the drivers of the change, at least among their peers. And they are the ones who can be a good examples for their peers. So if we start with one, two, three children, this community and the concept will grow bigger. And then we'll have not only communities where we work for children, but we'll have communities where we'll work with children. And this is what I experienced for the last three years, at least in, part, in terms of uh, protection of their rights. The second prerequisite that I would uh, underline is information sharing and dialogue between children and adults based on mutual respect. So you always explain the children your role, and they also have to understand why the communication is happening. What do they expect from you? What they should expect from you? And where this information sharing is leading? If it's about a very simple participation of the investigation in a police station, for example, right, of a child as a witness, the child has to, and of course we, we have to use it as a matter of the last resort, the association with the administrative justice and other things, but if it's inevitable, you have to explain the child what's his rights, what your rights are, what his position, what, he, what in which position he is, what would be the consequences, what information you want, um, what, what will you do with the information when which, which he says to you, and what could be the consequences? And then he has a right to withheld, and then he has a right to participate, and then he has the right to decide in general. Conducive and participative environment in a family, community, and society. We see very, very many communities when they say, um, you have to go to this or that section, a music school, to other things. In, in very, very many simple settings, in all the decisions that um, matters to them. Uh, we have to understand that giving a weight and giving a due weight in all the matters that refers to them is the most important thing. So uh, what, would, what do we do with this? Um, is it a right? Is it a privilege that we take? Is it a critical point? Or it fosters building these or that structures and phenomenons. For that reason, we have five outcomes of the participation. And this is very theoretical. And I start with the theoretical part to go gradually to the conflicting states where we have very many 
um, prerequisites of not respecting these or uh, other rights, but child participation becomes one of those important rights to promote as an agent. So I said the main outcome for this is um, participation as a right, participation as a critical self-development aspect. When, while growing, a citizen who has critical thinking and critical approach to different aspects in his life will lead to a participating citizenship and democracy in general, as I mentioned in the fifth point. Participation helps children to make a positive contribution in a society and build the democracy. It's very important. And life skills learning, enabling, and self-participation itself is uh, the leading part in this pathway. So um, there are different uh, formats, but I segregated for Maastricht University the main instruments that support right to participate and participation rights of the children, which are the, of course, the UNCRC Article 12. It's about view forms and rights, and we'll also see associated articles in a moment in Lundi's mod model. We have General Comment 12, which is about information sharing and dialogue between children and youth uh, to, to be taken into account. EU Charter on Fundamental Rights, also uh, referring to child participation. EU strategy, which has been very recent um, on the rights of the child and child participation is very important that it has been first time and it was launched in 2021, was firstly considered in a political and a demographic, democratic uh, aspect. So political participation of children was also considered firstly and formally in the EU strategy of the children's rights. And of course, Council of Europe has child participation assessment tool where it grants a possibility for the states to see how, to which degree, they provide child participation to children. These are the referrals that you can use in your further studies. And um, you can also refer it from different aspects, whether you are a lawyer in a criminal justice, whether you are a, a family lawyer, or whether you are just a political scientist who is considering of engaging children into the research, and you have to consider child participation policy while engaging children into the academic research. The biggest models of um, child participation, and I'm here referring to my professor, uh, Laura Lundi, professor of Belfast University. She is the author of the child participation models, one of the authors of the child participation models, which also got into the Irish uh, constitution afterwards. She said that the critical points to understand whether we provide child participation is to understand whether we have space to do this, and we do it by providing safe and inclusive societies. It's about providing voice to make their voices heard, but also we have to secure the influence these voices have and the audience where they are going to speak. So this is mutually reinforcing, and the other element wouldn't exist with the other, the other one. But in some spaces, we could see that her, herself also uh, realized it afterwards, that in some spaces, the voices and audiences could, could collide. So the child would be the out of the audience that he's or she is talking to. And the influence would be much about the space you give. So you, it's mutually reinforcing. And here you could see, and, and uh, we can afterwards share the presentation. I already see some people yawning, but I'll be finishing <laughs> in a minute. So we'll be talking about these different concepts and understanding of the, this concept and projecting this concept into Nagorno-Karabakh case. Um, here I would also like to show this slide about what other connecting rights do we have. So um, in UNCRC, we have, as I mentioned, space, voice, influence, and audience. We have right to express a view. So between space and voices, it's also about, not only about Article 12, but it's also about um, Article um, 19, which is right to, to be safe in general. And it's also about right to information, Article 13, right to guidance from adults, Article 5, which is considered mostly as a principle. Uh, Article 2, which is again another principle of UNCRC, right to have non-discrimination and best interests. It's um, 
the, the last is the most interpreted thing, and again, I should say that it should be considered, best interest of the child should be considered from the view, viewpoint of not limiting a child, but rather than giving privileges to the child of participate. And non-discrimination, hate speech, hate crime, should be the limits where we should say children no longer, after that, after pushing that limit, they have no longer right to uh, express themselves if this provokes hate speech, hate crime, or provokes a, um, aggression or discrimination toward other groups. So let's move a little bit to the political science. I know that most of the political scientists are yawning, but I'll try to also consider your interest too. So um, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, as a de facto state, is situated between Armenia and Azerbaijan. I have to refer to this with a consideration that you even don't know maybe about the Caucasus. So Caucasus here will refer to the South Caucasus, which has been situated between, so the main countries of the South Caucasus are Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. So Armenia is between Turkey and Azerbaijan from West Turkey, East Azerbaijan from North Georgia and from South Iran. So what we have is, uh, and Armenia is, Armenia is a Christian uh, country uh, to understand alone with Georgia and the rest of the countries are Islamic or Muslim. So, um, and by the way, the St. Cervantius Church has been uh, established by an Armenian missionary, St. Cervantius, or St. Kirakos, which is the name in Armenian. And I was happy to learn about the city story of the Maastricht. So it, it has long-standing uh, cultural and historical and uh, religious history. But after the um, collapse of Soviet Union, most of the countries around the buffer zone, so around Russia, they were considering getting independence. And this is how we have so many conflicting areas around Russia and its neighbors. We don't have immediate border with Russia. I mean, Armenia doesn't have immediate border with Russia, but Russia was engaged in this conflict in, uh, back in 1918, when they granted this territory as a present to Azerbaijan, as a kind of a friendly relationship between two leaders back then. And while getting independence in 1988, Actually, in 1987, when the purges in Baku started, the purges in Nagorno-Karabakh also started. So it was it gave away to first war of Nagorno-Karabakh back then, and uh, together with the support of Armenian military, um, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, declared its statehood. Let's say, and um, together with uh, Armenia, but it has never had a status of being an independent state, and it has never been recognized by any country, including Armenia. To the biggest shame, I should say that uh, the status question has been on the table for 30 years, and it never had a resolution. So to make it clear, now Nagorno-Karabakh created its own territory, so it has its own territory, and you could uh, see it. On this part, so this is the border with Armenia, and this is the territories of Nagorno-Karabakh, but the historical part was also taken together with a buffer zone. So in the middle of Nagorno-Karabakh, there was Nagorno-Karabakh, which belonged to Armenia back then, to the Armenian Kingdom, uh, and I'm referring to 1900s. And uh, there was a buffer zone. So the main fight of Azerbaijan throughout 30 years was well, actually, they were always referring to the buffer zone of seven regions. But, of course, the uh, ultimate goal was to take Nagorno-Karabakh fully. And uh, in 2020, after the democratic shifts in Armenia, and also after the uh, world order change, I would say, um, Azerbaijan started attacks on Nagorno-Karabakh and uh, started a 44-day war. Uh, whereas back then, Armenians have an effective control, which means that they also have an engagement and support of Nagorno-Karabakh military in that region. And um, as a conclusion on November, 6, November 9th, uh, there was a peace agreement. Actually, there were three peace agreements um, taken by the Minsk group. Minsk group was a format established by the UN to resolve Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, which, which never worked, and Azerbaijan proved that it doesn't work, and uh, it didn't uh, broker peace uh, agreement 
uh, when it started with Russia, first member of the Minsk group. The second uh, brokered um, peace agreement was with France. And the third one was US. So only after the fourth attempt, on November 9th, the peace agreement was reached and it basically left the nutshell of Nagorno-Karabakh in surrender. So all the seven regions, some of them were invaded by military of Azerbaijan and some of them were just given with uh, prerequisites of the, fee of, of the um, peace. And there was only one naval uh, channel left to Armenia, five kilometers of corridor, which only after two years was illegally blocked by Azerbaijan and Azerbaijani people were in surrender. And only last year, in, on September 19th, the whole civilian population was attacked again for two days. And with the fear that another Armenian genocide, another because the first one was happen, happened in 1915 by Ottoman Empire, which purged all the Armenian population from uh, east part of Turkey, back then Western Armenian. So the plan of Turks um, restituted once again in Nagorno-Karabakh in 2022, uh, 2023, sorry. Um, so afterwards, the exodus happened. So the whole population of 120,000 people remaining in, in the uh, landlocked uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, they flee mostly to Armenia. So you can understand that it's September 19, and the uh, situation is really fresh. And while referring to the conference that Marieke mentioned, children from Nagorno-Karabakh were missing back then. And three of them were on the roads in a um, thousand kilometers of queue to their way to um, Armenia. But it's, uh, I'll try to portray it in a different way, in a way that conflicting states and de facto states are viewed. So how the international community view de facto states? So it's a piece of land which self-proclaim themselves, referring to the self-determination right. Uh, they have symbols, flags, anthems, they have uh, government even divided government, judicial system, legislative system. Um, they have um, presidents, they have parliament, they have elections and other things. But they are not proclaimed by international society, mostly the UN. Uh, the UN. And they are mostly viewed as a country which has a parenting country. In Nagorno-Karabakh case, it's Armenia. Or by an aggressor country in which case it's uh, Azerbaijan. So here you see Nagorno-Karabakh within Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan was referring to the principle of uh, integration. Uh, and the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh case in Armenia was referring to the self-determination. So aggressor state and parenting state, and a statelet which has full independence and in all the treats of the um, state, and UN who's the main guarantor and who's the actually the international organization that recognize state as a state. And then we have another problem. So we say that rights of people in general, it's universal, no matter they come from. But at the same time, we say that the state has a duty to protect these, these, these rights. And on the other hand, we say that de facto states are not states. So what are they? A piece of land where people live? Okay, they still live. Do they have universal rights? They do. What do we do if the rights of these people are being violated? Question. Nothing. We leave them, and if we think about a group of criminals who try to commit a crime in de facto states that will succeed because no one but the state will prosecute them. And what if they flee from that country? Will this country have a possibility to find out the criminals and punish? No. So this is how the crimes happening in de facto states are justified. This is how the aggressor state 
is excuse of whatever crime is committed in this area. Let's say it's a safe area for committing a crime for an aggressor or forever, whatever um, person or, or a group is doing it. The other right, the other way around. So for 30 years, I said that Nagorno-Karabakh existed. And of course, they committed themselves in um, signing into the UN charters voluntarily. No one was uh, saying to them that you have to do a surveillance in Nagorno-Karabakh or children's rights. I did. Together with the Human Rights Defender Office, we did uh, monitoring on children's rights and we found thousands of cases, but we couldn't refer to anyone but the state. So the state had to um, do this, 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 and how do, we do, how do we secure this? If the state doesn't have a political will to do this, we can't um, enforce them. Um, they, here are some few examples of how being under the support of the parenting state doesn't help promoting children's rights. So basically, in Armenia, we have a law on large families, which is supporting large families. Like if, if you have more than five kids, you have this, 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 this allowances. For Nagorno-Karabakh, for years, it has been a very strong policy. So those families that have um, more than five, four children, so with every child, they were getting social allowances. And the idea and the theory behind was that the more children you have, the better the demography of this area is. So we, the, the different approach to this was Azerbaijani side. So what do they do is that they persuaded people who migrated from Nagorno-Karabakh, Azerbaijani who migrated to uh, Azerbaijan, to Ganja. There is, next to Ganja, there is a camp of migrants who left Nagorno-Karabakh in uh, 1988, 1987, 1999. And it was a very interesting statistic that one of the UN uh, high commissioners mentioned. They said, if these people were approximately, let's say, 2,000, how this number will grow? Because this number of people were growing in that area. It means that uh, Azerbaijani government was keeping them in the camps so that they can um, have children in the camps with the promise that you will go back to your houses 30 years, 20 years, 10 years afterwards. It didn't, it's not the same with the uh, Armenian society, with the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, but they were saying that the more kids you have, the, the better the demography would be. And in this regard, the families were growing and they were considering as a matter of benefit. So it's a, it's a way of having more money. And what we were serving is that um, very many families were getting the house with a fifth child and they were selling the house and they were using the money for the rest of the two years, or maximum three years, and then they, they would stay again poor. So the policy of large families was promoting nothing but poverty. This was something which we were very bold about. We brought the suggestion to the ministry and they were thinking about this, thinking till the last moment. And now we have a demographic issues of poor families in Armenia and in round places that they would move. Um, I mentioned about effective control. So if you take a look at the um, European Court of Human Rights decisions, Whatever decision there was, there was there is Nikolian against Azerbaijan. There are very many case um, case laws. They said that Armenia and Artsakh, of course, is not recognized. It's not part of the Council of Europe, but Armenia is. So the decisions were taken on Armenia. So they were. Um, let's say conveying the decision on Armenian side. But after 2020s, there was no effective control. Armenia didn't have anything to do for all, let's say, because before that there was a military control, before that Armenia could have done something in terms of human rights, but as a country which de facto was recognizing the sovereignty of this country, um, but not de jure, we could see that um, it, was, it didn't have effective control except for military. Um, so we see also that there was a policy of only material support and 
capacitation of children didn't happen there. Uh, the other one is the placement in the boarding schools. In Armenia, we progressed, for the last 10 years, we progressed a lot with day institutionalization of children from um, institutions that provide social services to the communities. But it doesn't mean, and it didn't mean, that um, it would have the same effect in Nagorno-Karabakh. So these are the few examples that we see that it didn't happen the same way so the parenting country, whatever developments are there in parenting countries or in aggressive countries, because uh, um, there is no population, of course, in Armenia, in Azerbaijan, in Nagorno-Karabakh, which is in Azerbaijan now. But even if there is, Azerbaijan wouldn't do the same. And if it's recognized as a part of Azerbaijan, then yes, and it will be referring to Azerbaijan. But if it's still recognized as a de facto state under effective control of uh, Azerbaijan, it wouldn't do the same. So Azerbaijan would still be responsible for the protection, fulfillment, and promotion of human rights within the territory with the recognition of de facto states. This is something which is happening in Pridnistrovia, which is on the border between Russia and Moldova. And it's a Russian-controlled area in the territory of Moldova. And this is happening the same way. So uh, it's happening in, San, uh, in Ossetia, I'm talking about the regions. In Abkhazia too, the recent case was there was a murder case in Abkhazia with two um, persons that their names were famous. I mean, they, 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 they knew their names, but it, there was no litigation, there was no process against them because it happened in a de facto state. So we see that with not promoting human rights in de facto states, um, we'll get into big trouble, let's say, in a very simplistic language. Now let's join these two concepts. So de facto states, political science approach, and legal approach on child participation. As I said, a due weight. As I said, all the matters that concern to children. And as I said, the environment, voice, space, audience, and influence. If we see that the societies not providing child participation go into conflict in societies, we have one less group promoting for their rights. There are thousands of cases, hundreds of cases, where children were resolving their, the enjoyment of their rights in Nagorno-Karabakh. There were at least 10 children reported who drove their families safe to Armenia, driving more than 400 kilometers. We have cases when children stood still in front of the Azerbaijani militia. We have a group of 20 children who came to Armenia for Eurovision Junior contest, song contest, and on the way back, they were blocked because their families were under the blockade and they couldn't return to their families. And on the way back, the Azerbaijani militia from a newly established checkpoint stopped the car and started looking at them. And we had three kids um, fainting of the fear. But they were standing still and, and um, they were standing bold to reunify with their families in, under the blockade. We have children who spoke on their behalf and who spoke on behalf of many children who are limited with their right to live in the countries they come originally from. And if the child participation is the case, and if we take a due consideration of their voices in a safe environment, the outcomes of this impact and the outcomes of these consequences and other things would be doubled, tripled in the conflicting areas. We would see that the skills and capacities we gave to them is rewarding back. So um, I am sure that you have questions, but I have some, um, I wouldn't say uh, homework, but I would say fruit for thoughts within several questions that I have on my screen. So what do we think? How, as an international society, how uh, we as adults and how as 
uh, coming from recognized states, secure the full enjoyment and universality of the rights of people in de facto states? Does the overlap of policies, laws, and children's rights strategies between whatever country we take, a parenting country, and I'm referring to Artsakh, which is the local name that they were giving for the country, instead of Nagorno-Karabakh, and Armenia guarantee the full enjoyment of the rights? Of course not. If, as a big society, we can't ensure um, and we can't seize many wars happening in Ukraine, Wars happening in Gaza, in Israel, in Palestine, in Somaliland, in Taiwan, in very many, in northern Cyprus, I can name, and I wouldn't exhaust the list. If we can't guarantee anything there, then shall we think about the universality of the human rights? Which are the mechanisms to guarantee those rights of children in blockade? What if they don't have... What if any country doesn't have an effective control of it, except for military control? What if they are deprived of elementary food, social services, healthcare, or whatever? Is it only about um, all the articles except Article 12? No, but Article 12 would be the voice and would give the influence and would give the audience and would make somehow these problems audible. Is the displacement a solution for human rights? Of course not. Every person, every child has taken their own problems and human rights violations to whatever country they take. Look at Europe, we have Syrian war and we still feel the consequences. No modern society is able of uh, replacing or replenishing that gap that happened back in their countries. No social system in Germany is possible to substitute the gaps that we have in Nigeria. And moreover, no childhood can be replaced. This is an opportunity missed. And if the childhood is missed, and it's, it's missed forever. There is a saying that they say, um, if you want to understand the psychology of the person, look at the childhood. And it's a missed opportunity if we miss it now. Who is the guarantor of enjoyment of the full rights? I don't have the answer. I'm a researcher and I'm still researching. But as an adult, I feel that we owe a whole generation in Gaza, in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Somaliland, in Sub-Sahara, in um, very many minorities wandering in Algeria, Morocco, and every region has this problem. We owe these children their childhood. And we as adults can't say that we have human rights systems on places. We can't say that human rights is fully enjoyed. And I can't refer to the words of Eleonora Roosevelt saying that human rights start from very, very small spaces, spaces that are not seen on the screen. And the enjoyment of these rights has to happen in all these small spaces, too. This is the end of my presentation, a formal part. But I'm more than happy to have questions from your side. Thank you for being patient and listening. There is one question there. We can pick uh, three and then, or, or if we have one only for the moment, then we can start answering one by one. And uh, please introduce yourselves too and the discipline that you are coming from. Hello, I'm uh, Paul, Hack Paul Hackens. So uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist and an economist. Um, well, my my question is, in fact, uh, you 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 put it all in a very uh, let's say uh, in a lawful way, yes. 
but uh, I don't really understand the basic problem, in fact. I, I, I just understand there is war, and if there or otherwise uh, a violent conflict, and if there is a violent conflict of a, or a war, everybody has it difficult, and it's difficult for parents to uh, protect their children, I guess. But uh, you only talk about adults and children. You even does not mention uh, the special role of parents for their children. Uh, why is this? I, I don't understand this. Um, yeah, well, thank you for the question. I um, rightly mentioned that it's about adults. And yes, and not parents, because I'm pretty sure the concept that the child is born is not only born in a family. So we shouldn't play uh, place a parent or an adult which is next to the child from the very start of their birth life to the only responsibility. We understand that if the enjoyment of certain rights is not full in the conflicting area, it's not full for the adults too, for the parents too. So the parents themselves are not the agents of changes. They are not the ones who will guarantee their right to participate. They are not the the ones who will guarantee their uh, right to adequate standard of health care. They will provide health care uh, to whatever terms it exists in their country. They will provide food at whatever it is possible. But if we talk about blockade, as I said, um, when we block the country from enjoyment or for provision of food, and by the way, the provision started on September 18, by the Court of uh, Human Rights decision, and on September 19, the war, the second war in Nagorno-Karabakh happened, which means that even the efforts of the international community was put to, the aggression still happened. So if we talk about domestic violence, let me go to another field. Then the parents, sorry? I don't want to refer to the problem of uh uh, uh, violence at home. No, no, no. I'm I saying just that. Just refer to the yeah. normal situation in which parents protect their children. Uh, what do you mean by saying normal, normal situation? situation? What do you mean by saying normal situation? Well, what I say, uh, normal is that uh, uh, parents take care for children. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that's to me a normal situation. And if you have a conflict, uh, uh, that's uh, diff difficult to do, I guess. Okay. So in, in a war, it's uh, it, there can be problems for parents to protect their children, I guess. What if the parents are missing? It's a question. But too. that doesn't mean that the role of the parents isn't important uh, or should not be mentioned. It's, it's a really important role, even in war. I didn't have an approach of downgrading the importance of parents, but vice versa. I had a approach of aggravating in making the the role of other adults which are surrounding children not only parents to fulfill those, those aspects that the parents cannot provide themselves as i'm saying is that uh, if the child is in a school then we have other adults who has a responsibility to guarantee certain enjoyment of the rights if we Refer to parents who are not fully aware or who are not in the capacity of taking care in his or her best interests, then there is a state system and structure who is going to fill these gaps. This could be about food provision, this could be about health care, this could be about safety, it's police stations, psychologists, schools and other adults. And my belief is that when the child is born, he's born in a society, in the world, which has to guarantee the enjoyment of human rights. And that's why I referred not only to the parents, but also to the adults. And later on, I referred to the human rights protection mechanisms, such as UN mechanisms that have been created, which do not cover the de facto states itself. And it's not only about war. We don't have war in very many areas. We don't have war in Pridnistrovia. But the enjoyment of children's rights and human rights in this area is not happening because there is no effective surveillance mechanisms of the UN bodies 
or any Council of Europe bodies, even though Moldova is in the Council of Europe? I hope it answers to your question. There is one question here uh, and two on the background. Hi, my name is Vaskin Sarkis. So I have a question about um, the uh, ethnic cleansings and the genocidal uh, part of this thing, and especially about the nine months of the blockade of the children. So, as I see from my point of view as a lawyer, um, is that uh, the rights of the children has been violated, specific in that part. So they are, um, in my opinion, um, that these children uh, could start a case by or by ICJ or by uh, Human Courts of Law uh, uh, in 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 um, Strasbourg. Um, the question is, in this specific matter, what is Armenia, Armenia or the Poles are doing at this moment mm -hmm. to collect the evidences because there are more than evidence, more more evidences there. So, when are uh, you expecting? to start a case or what what are the expectations about this part because we have a lot of evidences and what we can ex expect from that point and how of course we had it also by ICJ the uh, verdict that Azerbaijan uh, um, uh, has been uh, uh, in that verdict uh, that, that Azerbaijan lost the case so how can the people bring the justice or is it financial way or another way because those children have uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome also their parents have been killed a lot of them so what are the steps in it thanks thank you it goes more to a broader area on protection of human rights in general Unfortunately, not a single case has been launched in the European Court of Human Rights at the moment. All the cases are referring to the torture to the and back in 2020. And uh, at the moment, uh, there have been, if I'm not mistaken, 14 cases in the under the revision with uh, seven judges participating. So it means that for, for those who, who are not lawyers, uh, it's a precedent where the case is studied not only on the facts of admissibility but in the in the fact with the facts of consideration consideration of the matter so no case study has been before it's about torture of the captives it's about torture of civilian population and not a single case on children's rights well this is also because in 2020 um, there was no child population back then so we were referring to the human rights violations, but the whole population was evacuated to Armenia because it became a big battlefield. While talking about the ICJ, it's an interesting fact that it took us a long way, took the lawyers mostly, a long way to prove that this is an international conflict happening because International Court of Justice is considering the cases of international war. What does international war mean? It means that um, the parties which are engaged in war represent different countries. And Azerbaijan was not recognizing Nagorno-Karabakh as um, an independent state, as I said, Armenia too. And Azerbaijan and Armenia itself was not recognizing that they are in war with Azerbaijan, which means that because actually... In fact, the uh, armed forces of Nagorno-Karabakh fight, were fighting against Azerbaijan. So the admissibility case of the ICJ started only at the blockade cases, when we could see that Armenia didn't have effective control, it was proven, and it became an international conflict. So the conflict insights were two different countries. And it was prov proved... Um, when there was an attack of Azerbaijan on the sovereign territories of Armenia. So, um, for the moment, 
I see that um, there is, a, uh, referring to the first part of your questions about collecting evidences, I see that uh, Armenia for the moment started a process of uh, granting refugee status for the, for the people from Nagorno-Karabakh, proving the fact that Nagorno-Karabakh as a state did exist, and these people are stateless people. But there is a conflict in this regard. Nagorno-Karabakh people have the mentality going back to 1988, 1980s, where they were purges in Baku and they had a stigma of being uh, a person, an Armenian coming from Baku. And they very much resist to this. So from the government perspective, they have to uh, list and list people from Nagorno-Karabakh to have the data. Uh, they have to enlist the loss of the um, properties that they have. They have to document all of this and to have it as an argument to be used against Azerbaijan when the, only when the world order changes. Because so far in real politics, we don't see that there is a motivation and it has been proved during the blockade. It took us 10 months to prove that the people uh, has been deprived of all the sanitation, food, services, goods, whatever, in Nagorno-Karabakh. And it was a very, very difficult work to be done in UN, in EU, and in Council of Europe. You have a... In the line of your answer, uh, there is also, as we know, that Armenia is, uh, science very short, part of the ICC. So, if because Armenia is uh, part of the ICC, uh, they can refer it two years bef before. So, uh, I know that the ICC, the prosecutors, are looking for the evidences about Russia and Ukraine. The children has been kidnapped there and have been deported in Russia. So what about that part that Armenia maybe can start it in that case by the ICC? The case, is it a possibility? D the, uh, did the Armenian prosecutors of, uh, in Armenia any kind of work about did, uh, this subject? Thanks. I'll be very quick. I think it's an opportunity missed. As I said, Armenia was not has hasn't recognized Nagorno-Karabakh as a separate state. Um, de facto, it hasn't recognized. Uh, well, de facto, it was recognizing as a separate state, but de jure, it has never recognized it as a state. But the political will and the political context was that it's a separate country, and I proved this about human rights situations that. Except for the effective control, which has been a term used by UN, which is referring to the military control of um, Armenian armed forces being present in Nagorno-Karabakh. Except of that, Armenia has never referred to Nagorno-Karabakh cases if it's not individual cases. In ICJ and in ICC, it's all about the countries, right? And I don't know, to be honest, what the process should be taken to consider it now um, reverse in a reverse order, right, in a chronological order, to recognize it as a part of Armenia on behalf of which Armenia can represent Nagorno-Karabakh in these mechanisms. Be it, uh, well, it's a different case with Council of Europe because it's about individuals and they are citizens of Armenian Republic of Armenia. And this, is, this gives them a possibility to apply on behalf of the citizens, no matter it's a citizen from Sunik, is it a citizen of part of the Armenia or Nagorno-Karabakh, it's a different case. But if we talk about the country itself, then the status is shifted. So I always say that the lawyers and political scientists, they have to work together in these cases. Um, in cases of de facto states, I see that um, political scientists, they leave the room. Uh, political scientists uh, do not include uh, lawyers, so lawyers leave it to political scientists, and in the legal room, they leave it to the lawyers rather than political scientists. But we have to understand all this game because most of the time, the political order is about this. And about the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, how do we impose the decisions on the court, uh, of the countries participating to the Council of Europe? There is no mechanism. You have a judgment. We have a judgment uh, from uh, referring to the case, and it has been adopted in 2001, about 
uh, Nikolian versus Azerbaijan. You can study that case if, uh, for the further. What they did is like he applied against Azerbaijan about uh, not realizing his right to exercise his property, which has been left in Sumgait. Um, and uh, this case hasn't been followed up since then. What did Azerbaijan? I don't remember the surname of a person. I will refer back to this and we'll come back to you again. And uh, they did the same. So there was someone from Azerbaijan versus Armenia who had the same situation with the same case. And even the Nikolian, Nikolian case was considered as a case law with one judgment, admissibility judgments. So you see that it's a political game. Even it's about decision making, and even if it's it's about decisions at the European Court of Human Rights. Hi, um, my name is Sophie. I come from a perspective of um, political studies, but I've been working for UNICEF now. Um, and uh, my question was about child rights in business. I know that there's been a lot of work done within that and the influences that business can have on child rights that go beyond um, not engaging in child labor, especially in countries with small, medium-sized enterprises. And I was curious what you thought could be the role of businesses uh, in regards to this perspective in countries that have... Uh, now armed conflicts and how they can help uh, children or what their responsibility or their role is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> A very complicated question with different angles to answer. Child rights and business is uh, very often considered as within the sustainable development goals. So we have to understand the causes. And while understanding the child labor, we should understand also the international conventions of the International Labour Organization, uh, which is, together with the CRC, define child labour being an activity where the child is involved involuntarily, and the outcomes of this is not used for the child, so it's used for someone else. And this is how we define whether the child has been, whether child labour was happening or not. Um, it's difficult to consider it in terms of de facto states because I'm not uh, specialized in this regard. But as I said, um, if the resources and natural resources are being used in an area where we don't have human rights protection mechanisms in place, whatever you want can happen. Um, they could be, uh, if the system is well developed, the judicial system, the surveillance system is well developed, there could be some law proceedings within national legislation, within judicial system, but nothing than more than this. We have, um, I hope you know about the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and it's, it's a concept which has been developed on the basis of Millennium Development Goals. And most of the time it is about scientists who work on these concepts. So what happened is like, for example, in landmarking, in very many areas, uh, an organization, an uh, international business, which is called Nestle, was functioning on the lens which hasn't been marked somehow. Which means that through the corruption, and I'm referring to the system that doesn't work, this lens has been taken because there was no landmarking, no right to possess this lens, and the families and the rights of housing, proper housing, was um, being deprived because of the business, corruption, democracy, so-called democracy or the autocracy in these countries. So it's a very vague example which has deep and deep roots, but uh, I don't know to which, uh, how to exhaust you this question. De facto states is, again, something, uh, an area which doesn't exercise the effective environment, or it may exercise effective environment, but we never know uh, if the system is not in place. We never know if we don't have a monitoring. The universal periodic reports, which work in every recognized country in the UN, they somehow, or the charter bodies, or the charter monitoring groups that exist in the each uh, convention, they uh, do 
monitoring annually, and this is how we also, the international community also learns about human rights violations, but how do we know about violations in de facto states if at least this doesn't happen? It's a big question mark there. There was a question, I, th I saw another hand raised. Hi, my name is Lisa. I'm a student at the um, international school here at Maastricht. And I had a question more, less politically and less logistically, more of personally your opinion. As a child of war, moving away from it with now being able to have freedom and full enjoyment of my rights, how do you think Art of Article 12 affects kids like me now? Um, how can we better understand the importance of Article 12 among those kids and families now that they've moved away from it? How can we spread the word of Article 12 or just the importance of it in general? Um, I just want to hear your, some of your opinions on that. Yeah, um, so to make it clear, to my humble opinion, Article 12 and child participation is a very unique possibility of surveying human rights violations and child rights violations in these countries. So if, we, if the society is developed enough to make the children's front agents and advocates for change, then the international society would recognize this too. It's a um, mechanism of reporting. I would be really curious to learn which background are you coming from so that if, if I am able to cover it uh, with the concrete examples. But to me, child participation and human rights and, and raising human rights issues, human rights defender offices, um, self-development of human rights uh, surveillance mechanisms, one of them is uh, child participation. They are the only ways to uh, make these states recognizable, make the, the violations recognizable in these states. Because if the, um, there is no mechanism to survey it from outside the world, or if the parenting state becomes an aggressor state, we'll never know and it will be landlocked for the forever. And this is how I was interpreting child participation, armed conflict and child advocates. But I'll be very happy to know about the conflict that you come from. Would you mind saying the, the region that you come from? Right. Yeah, well, um, I would very shortly refer to this. And I would say that no conflict are like each other, none. I was studying Gaza very carefully within the concept of land for peace. And Gaza served, and uh, Palestine in general, served uh, the biggest refutation and failure of this concept. The land is never providing long-standing peace. And we see the infiltration for the last 50 years. We see the blames going into Cairo for David Camps. We see uh, historical statements of different many countries about the debt to give to Israeli people. But we never think about the self-determination of Palestinian people. We think about Gaza as a, uh, let's say, a cliche, a terroristic area, but we never think of people who've been deprived of everything and has no other way of self-declaring um, their state or self-positioning themselves. We don't refer back to the historical roots saying that the only channel connecting the West Bank to Gaza was blocked. And these people had nowhere else to go and nothing else to do. It's very similar with the blockade in Nagorno-Karabakh. And if we go back to 1958, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, there was a strip of line connecting West Bank to Gaza. It was blocked. It was the same with Nagorno-Karabakh. So the way to exhaust Nagorno-Karabakh people was exactly the same way, the same plan that Israeli had back then. But no terroristic attack happens there. happened there. The people still stood uh, alone. And uh, even exhausted, Armenia started provoking, promoting their rights. And it resulted only after 10 months of opening the border, which resulted with another war and exodus of Armenian people there. So it's really 
tricky to interpret one conflict with the other one, but we can learn from different con uh, conflicts. And I don't think that it's by chance that right four months after Nagorno-Karabakh, we had Gaza evaporating. Everything is connected, but if the society is silent about Nagorno-Karabakh, if the society is silent in um, in areas uh, in Lugansk, in Donetsk region, uh, then it can be silent in Gaza, and then it can be silent in different other conflicts. Even though we have a president of Kosovo, which was prevented by genocide uh, attempts, it's, this argument is always used by aggressor state to not being declared as an aggressor state to commit a genocide. The, even this word doesn't make people uncomfortable of doing things. And I'm here I'm referring to Israeli um, government who is still keep on doing, um, keep on committing crimes against children specifically. Um, you know that the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights, he resigned uh, a month after Gaza and a month after calling for peace in Gaza, uh, at least for the civilian population. But it didn't stop anything back then. So as we see, the human rights failure is also happening in Gaza. And thank you for sharing the uh, your experience. But I don't know. I, I think it's another childhood lost, and I'm sorry for that. Thank you very much. I just I have a question that relates a little bit to what you were just discussing, because um, I I think maybe it was even a little bit of a misunderstanding because I think you said you were from Israel just above Gaza, right? So you're actually you probably have a slightly different perspective, or possibly have a slightly di different perspective from UN Human Rights Commissioner, for example. Um, but what I'm really interested in and also struggle with, so I study uh, children's rights in de facto states. Um, and there's also a case study in Israel and Palestine, and I study both Israeli and Palestinian children living in the West Bank, um, and in other conflicts as well. The, the thing is that, it, so you were advocating, Mariam, for the right of children to be heard, right? Which I also completely agree is so important. And, and the thing is that I have seen over the years that in these conflicts, the, the what we call dominant narratives are very dominant. So, so depending on the community that you live in, uh, if you um, live in Gaza, you will have one narrative that is the dominant narrative about what's happening. And if you live in, in Israel, especially if you live close to Gaza, but in general, if you live in Israel, especially today, uh, since 7 October, there is one very dominant narrative about what's happening in Gaza, and that's different from the narrative that they have in Gaza. It's actually probably the extreme opposite. And as a child, living within the conflict, if you are invited to express your opinion, um, well, there are many difficulties that come with that, but one of the main things that I struggle with is when we ask children, like, what do you think about it? Um, how free are they really to speak their minds? And what do we do to them if we really give them the feeling that they are free to speak their mind? Because what if they say something that goes against the dominant, dominant narrative? I mean, if you are surrounded by... Um, let's take another example. So the, the Sahrawi people, uh, they are also, it's also de facto, the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic. So if you live among the Sahrawi people in the refugee camps in Algeria, then you have been born and raised and always taught that you are there, uh, that the goal of your people is to retake your country, which is the Western Sahara, to retake it from Morocco. That is you know, basically what you're, well, you're also living for other things, but it's definitely one of the main things of, of what your people is, is here on earth to do, let's say. So if you ever want to express anything else, if you're ever like, well, actually, no, I don't really care about Western Sahara, just to give it this is a hypothetical example, right? You're going against the dominant, dominant narrative of your people, your family, your culture, everything that you have always grown up, everything that the people around you are saying, and this can be very uh, problematic. Again, this is hypothetical. I haven't seen this. I'm not saying that the Sahrawi people would make a problem for this child. So I'm just giving an example. But I think you can imagine this as well if you are a Palestinian child or if you're an Israeli child. If you're an Israeli child and you're living in Israel today and you're saying that 
you know, uh, this is may maybe you're of the opinion that potentially this is very wrong, what they're doing to Palestinians, what the Israeli government's doing to Palestinians. But would you dare express that? And should we create a form of child participation? And that's my question to you also. In these examples, should we create a forum where children are allowed to express their opinions, even if that can bring harm to them? Because it may not... Or, 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 and if we don't allow that, are we then creating tokenism because we only allow them to repeat the dominant narrative of their people? You see the, the difficulty, especially when it comes to child participation in the context of these kinds of conflicts. Um, I talked about societies that have to provide the environment to, to child participation and uh, dominant narrative is another concept that is widely understandable. Um, we should also, I, I will ease my work. <laughs> I will try to Start push to it <laughs> in a different way. What if the child doesn't want to talk about work at all? He wants to talk about his daily issues. He doesn't have food to eat. He doesn't have, uh, he, he has some headache or he has some health issues that no one is taking care of because everybody's um, sick and tired or everybody is thinking about safety and security. What if... Um, the child was, wants to talk about both sides, and um, this is what we see about um, the consequences of war on children in general. So as I said in one of my presentations earlier, we have to capacitate children to understand that they can, um, the limits as I said, it shouldn't be hate speech and hate crime. And I teach children to teach their parents too that the dominant narrative uh, is can be discriminatory. Dominant narrative doesn't uh, provide his best interests, probably at that moment. Um, it's not only about participation in big auditoriums, it's also participation in the families. There was a person who, who left the room, but we're talking about parents. And we see that the, there, there is a generation and in conflict in areas, and you can imagine like in, in cases of Nagorno-Karabakh, there is 30 years, they've been a population who was repopulated, migrated from Armenia. So there was a policy in Armenia back then to move from regions of Armenia to populate the regions of Nagorno-Karabakh. We had from Banazor, which is the region, people going to especially buffer zones, which were not populated by Armenians back then because they were part of the Armenian four years. Um, in 2020, they were uh, forced to go back. And if we're, they were from the areas which hasn't been invaded by, by Azerbaijan, they went back again. So in 2020, those who were from Shushi, it's a city in Nagorno-Karabakh, or from um, uh, Hadrut, which was another city which has been taken, they were either suggested to move to Stepanakir, the areas which stayed, stayed the capital of Nagorno-Karabakh, or to move back to Armenia. Which means that if we have generation of uh, migrating in different areas, uh, eras, in different times. And you can imagine what's going on in this, in the heads of these adults. But it's a different, and it's not a dominant narrative anymore. And in armed conflict, the narratives are changing so quickly that even the adults would get confused. And the wishes of children would be still simplistic. I want to have a peaceful life. I want to have a right to life. And within the evolving capacities, as I said, if we interpret it in the correct way, um, if we do a mind shift among adults, the mind shift of child participation will like, also happen. And if this is happening and being exercised in the society, um, the dominant narratives would diminish gradually. Uh, we can never think of a person who wouldn't think about the loss of their possessions in Nagorno-Karabakh for the moment, five months later. But um, the, the shift is changing, the, the environment has changed, and the dominant narrative has also changed. It would never work at the moment of conflict, of course. The dominant narrative will be there. And at the moment of conflict, we wouldn't think about um, 
what to make the child to speak about. We'll think about ways how we can promote this or that right of the children. And if the children say that there is an influence, there is an audience, there is a voice, and there is an information and influence that I can have, then adults would have no other way that to listen to them because they have nothing to lose. And this is what happened with 10 children that I had from Nagorno-Karabakh. At first, there was a fear, a dominant narrative that you should talk about aggression, you should talk about historical lens, you should talk about how Azerbaijan treated us on the checkpoints, you should talk about this. And they said, so okay, but what's the message? I, I heard myself in front of the parents saying like, okay, I'll tell all of this, but what's the outcome of my speech would be? And then the parents would say, hmm, we don't know. And they, they will come up with the suggestions. And this is the mind shift happening. If we don't have a bottom-up approach, if we don't, we have only the situation and mindset, then we'll never leave the child participation happening. That's why I started with adults rather than children itself. So I hope that it was yeah. somehow responding. No, absolutely. It's very interesting. Thank you. Anyone else have a question or a remark or anything? Okay, then I guess we'll uh, we'll leave that there. Thank you so very much. Let's do one more Thank round of applause. Then I wish you all a very nice evening.